In this episode of the Michael Geeky Podcast, we're diving deep into the world of fungi with Jasper D, co-founder of Fungi Academy and a true ambassador of the fungal kingdom. Jasper's journey began with a quest to grow psilocybe mushrooms over a decade ago, and he's since traveled the world, building communities around fungal wisdom. Join us to explore how his passion for fungi inspires connections between people and their environments, and learn how Fungi Academy is sparking a mycological movement worldwide. Yo, welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, where we explore the fascinating world of mushrooms and the people who love them. From expert cultivators to passionate foragers, we bring you deep conversations, cutting edge insights, and everything mycology. Whether you're a seasoned mycophile or just curious, we invite you to geek out with us on the wonders of fungi and join the mushroom movement. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky. We got a great show for you tonight. We're hanging out with Jasper D of Fungi Academy. Yes, he makes amazing videos. Yes, he's got a retreat center in Guatemala. Yes, it's the bomb. Yes, he's a cool guy. Yes, I had an absolute blast hanging out with this dude. I will tell you this, though. He's got Starlink down there in Guatemala. He's in the middle of nowhere in Guatemala. He got you Starlink, guys. He doesn't, he doesn't, he can't, the Spectrum guy is nowhere to be seen down there. So uh, we had a little technical difficulty. So you'll notice a little, uh, a, a point about 26 minutes into the interview where there's a little format change. And uh, I, I, I verbally sort of acknowledge it in, in the second half. And then the second half, there's just some slightly weird audio um, it, it, it's not, it's not super distracting, but it is there. I just want to give you guys the heads up. Um, we did our best though. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're working with what we got. Some, some of these amazing people in our Myco community online, they're everywhere. They're, they're in the middle of nowhere. They're, they're on the side of a cliff. They're hiding out in a hole. You just don't, you know, we, we, we've had this before. So anyway, and, uh, Still some great episodes, right? Mushman 9000, the audio was a little, little choppy on that one. That was still an epic podcast, that first podcast. So uh, I, I, I've i probably had hundreds of people tell me, what a cool guy. So glad you had him on. Yeah, the audio was garbage. We, we, we did our best. Before we do that, shout out to Stealthy Spores. Go get you a 2024 summer deck. It's got cool cards, guys. Also getting super excited uh, in less than a week. Well, what is it? So, uh, yeah, way less than a week, freaking three days. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to NAMA with happy. We're going to go have a good time. Uh, word on the street is it's been raining nonstop for weeks there. Uh, I had a local who does a lot of foraging around my, Mount St. Helens. Tell me, he said, he's never seen it like this in his memory. This is about as good as it's ever been. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to prepare for what I think is going to be, uh, some pretty epic mushroom hunting. Anyway, I'm going to redirect that enthusiasm, that, that unbridled excitement that I have for NAMA right now back into someone I got a chance to interview uh, last week. And I'm telling you, Jasper D, this is a special guy. Uh, I really like this guy. I really connected with this guy. He's uh, a, truly a phenomenal ambassador for, for mushrooms. And uh, I, I hope you guys enjoy our little time getting to know each other. All right, welcome to the show, Jasper D of Fungi Academy. What's up, man? What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Hey, man. Well, you know, I, I woke up and I said, you know who I haven't talked to? I haven't talked to, let's find somebody down in Guatemala who loves mushrooms as much <laughs> as I do. So, uh, yeah, so let's do it. You have a, a, a really nice little, uh, it's not a yurt, but it's like a an official yurt, like a little what do you call that? It looks nice. It's just a little house, actually. Like you could call it the casita. It's like I can show it around. We have like it's just like it's actually elevated, so it's like this first floor. So like this is above ground level. So this is kind of kind of weird shape. I got a chimney in here, like a hearth. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's a big open space. I can flip it around for the people as well. This is kind of my view. Ooh. Love it. Oh, what a terrible view. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how I do it, man. How do you do it? Only by the grace of the mushrooms do you make it through each exactly. day. Yes. Well, man. Well, 
that that setup looks a little bit like we uh we got a friend down in uh veracruz uh that, that we go to and she's got a little setup like that and uh boy it just looks wonderful you must just love it down there man Life's pretty good around here. That's great. All right. Well, so let's do this. We'll, we do this every time. Uh, I got to get your first mushroom memory. I actually talked to my mom about this, and she doesn't remember this, but I have a memory, and I don't know if I fabricated it when I was a kid or anything, but, like, I remember I grew up next to a forest, and, like, I remember, like, being maybe, like, four or five and seeing an Amanita muscaria and just being really drawn to it and being, like, wanting to touch it and my mom being kind of, afraid of it so it's just, oh, don't touch it uh so that's my first mushroom memory is just seeing this amelie de muscaria and it was like drawing me in and uh yeah i think that was pretty young so i'd say that's my first memory and then i also have a memory of like being five and i never liked eating dotted mushrooms when i was young like agaricus it's a funny um it's a funny thing that seems to be Co relatively common for mushroom people that they grew up not liking to eat agaricus mushrooms. I don't know if you've heard this before or you experienced this as well. Uh, I mean, I ate them, but yeah, I didn't fall in love with eating mushrooms till I ate wild mushrooms for sure. Oh yeah. yeah, it's like a whole different world. Oh man, and then you get an agaricus augustus, like the prince they call it. Man, that is a tasty mushroom. Oh yeah, we get, I don't, I have never eaten any of those. Uh, the we call them uh horse mushrooms um i forget what the latin name is but yeah the, those are we get quite a few of those out here and they're so good they're so good but they're not even they're so good but there's so many other great mushrooms so those little canned mushrooms they just can't they can't compare they can't compare no this is true so that's that's also not a young young mushroom memory for a uh, tiny jasper all right man so well that's cool the amanita story um, so I grew up in Michigan and we lived literally, I was two houses down from the state park. I lived in the woods. I mean, I am not over exaggerating. I wouldn't play with my toys. It was just me and the neighbor. And we were just out in the woods, riding our bikes, building forts, screwing around by creeks and rivers and streams and lakes and all that stuff. And mushrooms were just always so cool. They're so foreign. They seem you know, almost like they don't belong. Like, where did this magically shaped and colored item come from? And so, yeah, as a kid, I can only imagine. I didn't get any big red amanitas to look at, but I, I can imagine that one drew you in for sure. Oh, yeah. They're like playful, you know? I think I was already playing Mario at the time, probably. So <laughs> I was like, I know that. Yeah, they're just, I mean, dear God, it's a beautiful mushroom. And in general, I, I think one thing with all us mushroom people is we're just in love with the morphology. There's just something about mushrooms in general. And then, dear God, when Fantastic Fungi came out and we got to watch all these time lapses, and then really the appreciation of the formation of them and all that stuff. Yeah, man, it's we're we're it's over. We're we're all we're all addicted now. We can't get enough. Shout out Planet Fungi. They made all those uh they made all those uh, time lapses, man. They're amazing down in Australia. Um, amazing, amazing videography. So Amanita muscaria. That is a wonderful mushroom to have your first mushroom memory of. Um, do this. So I do this with everybody. Now, I feel like when I ask you this question, uh, I'm, I'm going to just sit back because I think you got plenty to say about it. I want to hear your myco origin story. So I want to hear about what led up to you having a life in mushrooms. Yeah. So uh, this is like quite the story. So you can definitely sit back. We're going to do the short version, the long version. I've done the long version before in other podcasts, but it's, it's quite a fun story. So uh, I'm from the Netherlands. So up until 2008, you were able to legally buy Slavsky Defense's mushrooms in stores. They call them smart shops. Uh, I'm a little younger than that. So I came into my like adulthood just after the laws changed. But as maybe people that have been to Amsterdam know, so you can buy magic truffles still, which are kind of these sclerotia that are formed mainly by Slavsky Tempinensis, Slavsky Mexicana, etc. I think there's about five species now that form these sclerotia that you can eat. And um, yeah, I was quite depressed as a teenager. I didn't really find my, like, my groove in school or like friend groups and stuff like that. And then one time, just after I turned 18, we were on this like 
Strand holiday, which is kind of like just a booze holiday. Uh, you go to an island and there's a bunch of other young people and you go party and chase girls and stuff you do when you're 18. But then my friends brought some of these truffles and like, it's also a beautiful island there. Uh, it's called the Schelling in the Northern Netherlands. And I was, I was just curious of anything that like changes my consciousness. So I'd say like I had like a very small amount. I'd say I, now I could call that a mini dose or what back in the day on Arrowhead, we would call a museum dose, kind of like a, so now people could call a hyper dose. So it's like more than a uh, micro dose, definitely perceptible, but like not a full dose. And I had a great time. Like I had like, we had such a fun time just cycling through the forest and hanging out on the beach. And I was really intrigued and I wanted to have uh, an experience myself. So I, I bought like a couple of weeks later or something, I bought like a container like that. My parents were out of town and my brother and sister. So I had the whole house to myself. I ate the full container, started watching The Lion King because I think I read on the internet that's a thing to do. You just watch a movie or like a cool animated thing, which now I would not recommend people do it. I, I started to watch it to, like just after eating it and just waited for it to come up. And then kind of that scene when Simba is in the, like the, the, the gorge and all the, the wildebeest comes storming in, like the mushrooms really started hitting me. And I was just kind of sucked into this like story, this experience. And I, I just became Simba to an extent. And then, like, they have that scene of Simba going to, like, the jungle with Timon and Pumbaa and, like, kind of fucking all up all of his responsibilities and just being laid back, not living up to his potential. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm like Simba. I'm not living up to my potential. Uh, and then you have the whole scene, like, at the end of the movie of, like, the whole kingdom burning to ashes and then, like, rising from the ashes. And that was all, like, metaphorically, like, pretty powerful. I really... Uh, I really felt resonance with that. Um, so I, I, after that, I was hooked. And then I started listening to music and I just hanging out. It was a beautiful summer day and cried out of happiness for the first time in my life that I can at least remember. And it was a really profound, like life-changing journey. So I, I became kind of the psychedelic advocate. Like, I think a lot of people experience this. It doesn't matter if you're young or old, if you had like a first life-changing psychedelic experience, like you become, people seem to become kind of these uh, spokespeople, these cheerleaders for the mushrooms, basically. And, and sometimes a little bit too much, like I was telling everybody, you should eat these mushrooms, they'll change your life forever. And um, I was actually like buying some for my friends as well. These were not necessarily really cheap. And I think like a couple months into that, I was visiting a friend who was a little bit older and he had like a, a mushroom broke it uh, flushing at the time. So in the Netherlands, you can still buy basically with these plastic containers of brain spawn and you just rip open the container and they just tell you to miss it. And then you fruit the mushroom straight from the grain spawn. And I just did some quick calculation how much mushrooms I could get. And like, it was just generally going to be cheaper to buy these grow kits and grow my own mushrooms than keep buying these truffles. Uh, and then, like, I was going on the shroomery. I was already on Arrowhead and all of these other fora that were popping, like, 14 years ago. This was all happening at my parents' place, under my bed, basically. And then I, I found out that I could just add coconut coir with some hot water and some vermiculite. I wasn't adding gypsum, but, like, to get more mushrooms. And I was just basically doing one tiny toad at a time, and I was and just drying them in my room. And that was, like, more than enough for me and my friends to just have enough mushrooms that we wanted and then I, I feel like this happens to a lot of the people oh. um that like you know in the beginning the mushrooms are generally more uh kind and sometimes uh, when you like experiment more with them and like you go deeper in your work with them they become can become kind of more strong firm teachers and uh, that was not something that I was super enjoying at like 18 and 19. So I, I moved away from mushrooms and kind of was like experimenting more with other psychedelics like LSD and 2CB and whatever I could get my hands on. I was one of those people that was on the dark web 14 years ago and didn't see Bitcoin as an investment. And I don't know. If you were moving, you know, doesn't matter. Um, it was what I was experimenting with. and. You know, 
the whole like life in the Netherlands that was kind of cut out what people just expect you to do didn't feel for me. And I, um, a couple of years later, like 21, I had a good job. I had a great friend group. I was like going to lots of parties, but like, I just felt like something was missing in my life. And I was just, now I could call it like, I would be, could be all high and mighty and would call it like, oh, I did a solo ceremony. But in reality, I just took some 2CB and I was playing video games by myself. And um, uh, I was about playing video games. I was having this conversation with, which now could say the higher set, my higher self or something, or some form of entity. And uh, that entity just told me to go travel. And I did a thing that I also recommend nobody to do right now. Next day, I quit my job and I bought a one-way ticket to Thailand every six months or something. But I ended up being gone for like two and a half, three years. And then Southeast Asia, I was just like enjoying life. And one day on a hike, I've, I found like, so in Northern Thailand, you have wild elephants. And we found like this elephant dung and like I found a mushroom growing on it that looked very familiar. And I wasn't really into foraging only for psychedelics at the time, but it just blew me away that I could find this mushroom in the wild. And uh, Southeast Asia is a really good place for Psilocybe cubensis and other uh, psychedelic mushrooms like Paniola sinescens. So that became like a side thing for me. I would just like go out and try to find these psychoactive mushrooms over there. And then I, because I've so I had so much time to myself, right? I wasn't just like partying and drinking, which was also a big part of that, and getting to know myself on a sort of like soul quest by just having all this free time. But I had a lot of time to read books, and I was traveling a lot, and I, I had like an e-reader, and I was uh, I remember reading like uh, mycelium running somewhere in Australia. It was at this work away situation. They had all these mycology books, and I just just anytime I could know more about mushrooms i was just like absorbing it all until years later lots of travel later lots of amazing experiences that i'm incredibly grateful and privileged to be able to have had in my life uh i was traveling okay is it like now we have to talk about how i got to fungi academy which is a whole weird story as well so uh I've, when you just go backpacking and you do the classic backpacker circuit it gets a little stale to just take a bus from one backpacker place to another. And like, it doesn't feel like an adventure so much. So I forced myself to do hard things while traveling. So I tried to get from Seattle all the way to the Amazon without flying or paying for public transport. So I hitchhiked uh, along the West coast and somewhere in California, I traded somebody that one of my sweaters <laughs> for a mushroom chocolates um, or a bunch of mushroom chocolates. And I I sailed from like LA to around Baja California and I ended up couch surfing with these girls in Mazatlan and they had this tiny pet pig. And and this is crucial to the story because I forgot I had these mushroom chocolates somewhere in this bag. And the the girls they told me, Oh, you shouldn't leave any food on the grounds because the pig is gonna eat the food. So I had this bag of food, I put it somewhere else. I hadn't touched those mushroom chocolates for a minute. So I left that just on the ground somewhere. And it was right next to all my bank cards and credit cards. So we were having dinner. And like, we just hear this noise coming from the room I was staying in. And it just clicked. I, I remember the mushroom chocolates. We got in. This pig is just mauling on my bag. We try to pull this pig off. It didn't eat the chocolates. So we didn't have like a tripping pig in the house. But like, it just like completely broke the bag and all of my cards in it. So all the... Uh, chips were broken so I, here i was in mexico without my credit cards or my bank cards or any of that so uh, i was able to pay all the ladies and they were able to give me cash and i was able to keep going with my travels i was in a like my travels took me to the mountains of oaxaca uh san jose de pacifico and then i i did a mushroom hike with uh, a couple of friends and we ended up in san mateo which is a really nice little town there as well and and of course, it was like nice mushroom season. So eating all of these different species I've never eaten before, like sape de corum, mas de corum, etc. And um, I found this sticker of the, the Fungi Academy, actually. Uh, and this is uh, 2018, maybe early 2019. 
And I was like, this, this sounds like a great place. I wanted to go to Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. Uh, I like mushrooms and how to grow mushrooms to an extent, but I have not done agar work up to that point. And um, I would just send them an email. Uh, a couple of months later, I ended up coming to Guatemala. Uh, but then by entering Guatemala, somehow PayPal was like, whoa, what the fuck's happening? And it blocked off my PayPal account. So uh, initially it was really difficult because I didn't have money and there was this tension between the people that were running the place and I was not able to pay. But <laughs> I was there also working. And that's where I met Oliver, who was the founder and kind of my mentor within Fungi Academy. And initially we, we didn't fully hit it off. There was definitely some friction. And if I would have had access to my finances, I would probably have left early because I was just not feeling the place. I was basically there by myself and the whole lab was moldy and like there's so much work, but because I didn't really have anything else to do, I just started cleaning this lab, which took a long time. And then I just started like, there's still a really amazing library of fantastic mycology books. I just started really like systematically going through the making notes and like just fully dedicating my life to learning more about cultivation and mycology in general. And, and then later on, like my relationship with Oliver became warmer. There were some amazing people that started being drawn to the, the community. And Oliver invited me to teach this workly, weekly workshop, which at first was like, oh no, I don't know if I can teach. I don't know anything. And then like the, my first workshop was like, six hours and we're, all of us were just like kind of like damn that was way too much i'm like okay i think if i can teach six hours i can teach like mediocrely i can teach like an hour workshop decently and then i started teaching every week which also i think teaching can be a really good like tool to learn more because people always ask questions and if you don't know the question that's like a really good invitation to look into that subject more so uh, I was teaching every week and then people were coming in. So I was sharing what I was learning about cultivating in like a really low tech, kind of horrible situations, um, which I think is a, in, in Dutch, we have a really fun saying. It's like on an old bicycle, you have to learn it. Op een oude fiets moet je het leren, which is a great metaphor. And I think if you know how to do mycology with the most bare bones equipment, in a really hard place with lots of, like, you know, we're basically here in the jungle. There's lots more, like, microorganisms just floating around in the air. Uh, it's going to be harder to have a successful mushroom cultivation operation than in, let's say, a high desert like Colorado. So if, I, if somebody knows how to grow mushrooms in this more challenging environment, it's going to be easier to uh, then go back to Colorado and get a nice proper flow hood and then, like, do your whole thing than the other way around, I believe. So that's kind of the the origin story. And before you know it, we're like almost six years later and um, still still like living life in dedication to the fungi. You really, you started at the bottom, right? Just sweeping the floors and cleaning the lab. And yeah, I love it. And, and it's just so obvious that the, the mushroom keeps calling to you and calling you back and pulling you back in. Uh, I can definitely relate to that. Um, and you are so right about teaching. Um, a lot of times, uh, at least in, in the online cube community, I see a lot of people get really upset because some new grower, as they start understanding some of the principles, then they want to, they're very eager to want to like help others. And some of the, the OGs, they go, ah, oh, these guys need to shut up, right? I should tell them how to grow because I've been growing for 10 years. And sometimes, yeah, there are people giving bad information out, but overall, I think I'm like, that's a sign of somebody who wants to now contribute and help and be a part of the community. And like, look, we can't correct every incorrect statement that's made on Facebook. It's just, it's, there's too much going on. So I think that's a really important point you make. And I think something a lot of people should think about, which is even if you don't want to be a formal teacher, if if somebody hops in your DMs and says, hey, I like your grow, you know, what did you do? You can dismiss them or you can take that moment to actually tell them what you did, answer some questions because you are so right about when you put yourself in that position, people will start asking you questions and then now you're obligated to go find the answers to those questions. So 
Yeah, I think that's the good spot to put yourself in if if you really care about what you're doing. Okay, so let's talk now since you've been at Fundry Academy and you got the lab cleaned up and you you know yeah. you put you put the numbers on the the Dewey decimal system on the on the the books down there and got everything in order and researched. What has your journey uh, with Fundry Academy looked like over the last six years? Yeah, so I showed up in an interesting time. Because like the, there was this initial groups of people, like the three people that founded the, the idea were Oliver, Sylvan, and Danelle. And they met at like a rainbow gathering, which is like a bare bone. I always like to call it like Bernie Man for people with no money, somewhere in the like jungle or wherever. And you like come together for a month and you there's camps, but then there's no electricity and like you all share food. And it's like super ultra like hippie. If you think of hippies, like that's that's where hippies go. And um they they met there and they they kind of wanted to bring those what we call rainbow principles into the community um but then when trying to make it happen and actually make it into something that can sustain them uh like Danelle and Sylvan felt it wasn't really working out for them so they just left like several weeks at least Sylvan left several weeks before I showed up so there was a really interesting like almost like passing the baton that I didn't know that was was happening at that time. Um, so Oliver was looking for somebody else to do this project with. And, you know, I, I, at first I was stuck, but then I eventually was like, okay, I like, this is the first time in my life that I, I want to like commit to something. And Oliver had, I had this idea of moving from the building that was kind of donated to the project that kind of ironically had like a mold problem. So it wasn't really like a healthy environment. It was, it was small, it was really hard to reach. It was like way up the mountain in some, uh, near San Marcos La Laguna here in, in Lake Atitlan. And this property that we're currently been uh, like stewarding for the last five years or so became available to, to at le least rent. And Oliver asked me like, yo, I wanna do this. Uh, but <laughs> he, he told me I don't have any money. And he just looked me in the eye and was like, do you have money? <laughs> And I had my savings planned for this whole trip, right? For like several years of travel that like I hope to just like fuck off with. And I, I was put like in front of this choice of having just pissing off and freewheeling and having a good time or maybe like putting the first steps to, you know, dedicating my life to something. So so that's what we did. We moved all the stuff from San Marcos here to Tuluna, which is not super far, but it was definitely still a lot of work and like the moment we got here stinks just started opening up we had immediately like a great influx of new people suddenly like just like 20 people i was the community manager i never managed a community before i've been a sales manager before so there's so much learning not just like about mushrooms and all the things i was still doing managing the lab but like also about interpersonal relationships and the, the power of community and that's more and more that like what I really see the beauty of is like the what we call the human mycelium network, right? Like we are all like nodes within a network and we are made to be group a pack we're a, we're a pack animal, right? We thought we we may be raised to believe that we are this individualistic like beings, but nobody on their own can survive long term. Nobody. And we need other people around us. And it's sometimes fucking hard to deal with other people. <laughs> Like, you think that, like, there's a bunch of, like, super intelligent, super conscious conscious people living together. Trust me, people still fight over doing the dishes. Like, like it's not our the dumbest stuff, man. And then, like, you have to deal with all of that and, like, all of the emotions. And, like, we often refer to the community as a house of mirrors because you always project stuff. Because we always had, like, an, a frustrating father figure or, like, a teacher that then somebody that has a leadership position can represent in your life and then you feel this friction and then how do you get over that? It was a big thing. And yeah, that was 2019. We did a bunch of like in-person courses that we were still hosting. So the, the seven, the, the one week mushroom cultivation course, which Fungi Academy has been hosting since 2016. And I've been like facilitating since 2019. Um, so we did a bunch of those that like got some more 
flow coming in. So we were uh, like flow of abundance. So we could keep being here. And then 2020 hits and we all had the choice of like, oh, do we want to go back to where we live and not know where it's happening? And we're kind of remote here. And like we had the community. So for me, it was the obvious choice to just stay and stay and like just see what happens with life. And uh, it was actually like a great decision. Like I, I never had any of the, the weird lockdowns where, hey, like I showed you earlier, like we're here, like just surrounded by nature. Uh, but also we, we had to make a step into doing something. All right, guys. Well, so we had a little technical difficulty. Um, StreamYard was giving us some hard times uh, and, and we kept trying to fix it. But ultimately, we gave up, and now we're 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 gonna give old uh, Boomcaster a try here. So, format's looking just a touch different, but the feeds are looking great, and hopefully, we can uh, yeah rock out here and and finish the story. So, I think the last thing we were talking about, Jasper, um, I think you were just starting to talk about pivoting um, during COVID, like what to do. Do I go back home? Do I do I stay in Guatemala? So uh, so kind of pick up from there. Yeah. So. Uh... Like that was a choice, but like, honestly, it wasn't much of a choice. It was just a very easy decision to just stay here. Oliver already had like this idea of making an online cultivation course. And this is bef like, you know, we were the only people basically like talking about like cultivation with our faces present. Like a lot of people were doing this on YouTube. I think Willie Michael was doing this already, but like everybody was still like worried about their faces being revealed during those times. And I think it was us and Darren LeBaron at the time that were actively sharing how to grow cubensis uh, online as well. And then we made this, we decided to make this cultivation course in 2020. And like Oliver's envision was always like not to just teach people how to grow, but also how to properly prepare for the medicine journey. Uh, and we worked together with this really amazing elder and teacher, Julian Fame from the UK, who's been part of like a breaking convention and the psychedelic scenes for like 40 years, man. This is, he's an absolute legend. And he made the, what we call the psychedelic journey work course. So the course that like teaches, maybe people have never done it. That that was kind of what we want, needed to do. And we needed a videographer and like pure chance, uh, a guy I met on a beach in Vietnam and he's a, it was, he's still a videographer, an amazing videographer, shout out Holden. Uh, and like, we kind of proposed the idea to him and he was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. What else is happening right now? Let's just make a, uh, the first full on, what we call like shroom, a sport, a shroom cultivation course, besides those old DVD tapes, like let's grow mushrooms. I think they're called like that. I think came out on the internet. Uh, so that was the goal. So we made like this pretty in-depth video series on really for anybody, like you get a sports range, what do you do with this? How, like, how do you approach this? Like all that's like completely covered with that other course. And we made like those two video courses, which like, man, that was like 12 hours of pretty high produced video yeah. content in like, a, less than a year and like we were writing all the scripts and all that stuff um so that that ended up being pretty good oliver had like a tiny mailing list that he was utilizing and actually on the day that like my my savings ran out the electricity was about to be cut off like we had to pay rent like we, we launched the thing and like it was uh, a pretty big success from the beginning which really kind of saved our asses <laughs> in, uh, in a way uh, it was divine timing. Actually, the electricity did get cut off because I was like, okay, take it. I had to take up money and like pay the electricity, but it was too late. So that was like a, like how clutch it was for us to have that. that um, yeah, that launch happened and that's, that just kind of catapulted us. And then like we started seeing a massive increase in our growth on the Instagram and therefore the mailing list. And it was just kind of all like, at the beginning of what people now call the shroom boom and the psychedelic revolution got more attention because especially during COVID when other, like the people in the West were like in these, like, you know, in their room, people were looking for a way out and way out for depression. And, you know, we, we, we people call it the blue bubble sometimes these days as well, that everybody started to grow in cubes and the price for cubes just skyrocketed. And then within two months, everybody had too many cubes and it just like, plummeted after that all also happened in 2020 2021 so that was a kind of a big year for mushrooms and i think uh 2020 was also the year that like fantastic fungi came out so it was all just like like it was the COVID year of course but it was also like the mushroom 
year to an extent. And yeah, man, like at the end of 2020, like everything was going fantastic. And then we like out of nowhere, like we lost Oliver. Uh, he passed away at the end of 2020, like due to a tragic accident. And, and then I was again with a, a choice, like, do I carry on the legacy? Do I carry on this dream? Do I carry all this weight on my shoulders? Or do I just keep going what I was doing? And, you know, that wasn't really a question either. So we made a restart. Then was dating, uh, Karina at the time and she was helping us with social media and then she really stepped up and we're like business partners now and like it's just more people joined in the team and um yeah it's been we made a it's been just going at that and like we just dedicate our lives to the the mushrooms and sharing our love that we feel for these organisms with other people and, and you know that just attracts people that's why people are attracted to your podcast as well that's why people are attracted to just like this again like to rephrase it as the human mycelial network like we are all like it's just such a bonding thing if you're like oh you're a mushroom person i'm a mushroom person like it just instantly connected there's this meme right like oh we're best friends i think it's from a will ferrell movie or something what did we just become best friends yep do you want to go do mushrooms in the garage yep dude that's cool uh man that sucks about oliver um i i have had a few family members vanish just like that because of drunk drivers and and just fluke accidents it just it, it it just it's a good reminder that just man it's never no it's never no so man do 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 what you love do do something that you feel called to do 100% um yeah and that's great yeah so you actually you just made me think about this cuz i remember when i started the show I just knew I wanted to do a video podcast. I knew I wanted to show my face. I wanted to make that statement. Um, and I wanted to normalize and say, like, I have every right. I got ADHD. I got every right to grow some mushrooms in my basement and see if they help my ADHD. Little did I know how deep this rabbit hole was going to be for me. But, but like, yeah, so back in the day right it was all cloaked in secrecy nobody ever showed their face i didn't even know you guys had that going on uh, uh before then i knew since then you guys had did the stuff because i started seeing it about that time um so talk me through like that decision okay so darren was doing it in the beginning dude i don't know what you guys encountered i had people emailing me and dming me going you're a fed there's no way you'd show your face and do this. You're crazy. And if you're not a fed, you're going to be in jail in two weeks. Like just you watch. And I mean, the amount of hatred I got just for doing it was insane. I mean, not from everybody. Most people loved it, but some people were just obnoxiously aggressive towards me about it. And like, who do you think you are? And this, that, and the other thing. Um, but it's important. It's important. I, I, again, more privileged than your people from North America. I'm Dutch, man. Like, what's like, my, what's my government gonna do? You can like legally grow these things, right, right? So it's like, for me, it was like never an issue of like, like it's been uh, okay. So technically, it's illegal to sell them now. Ah, it's so low priority, like the lowest priority. I've never heard anybody getting busted for mushrooms. Maybe if you have like a massive warehouse operation and they stumble upon it or something, like there's just like they're too busy, like. You know, we have the second biggest harbor in the world, Rotterdam, where like all the cocaine in Europe goes into. That's where what the like Dutch police are like working with, not mushrooms. So like, like that's also you know the the privileged position of like I know a lot of people have payments uh, that have businesses in in, in mushroom issues uh, industry, and they have issues with Stripe and PayPal because you know oh we don't know if this is legal. Oh, we just do we're just educating, and this is 100 percent legal within the Dutch law. So we we are like set so that like that's just a a glimpse and i do think that there's this narrative right that if these this technology these amazing organisms were completely allowed we would have less people having challenging experiences and i have a pretty great example of this when i was 18 i was sharing our truffles before i was growing mushrooms i shared like we went we we did doing the crazy stuff we would buy them in the store in a city and then we just like hang out in the city and then, like, one night, I was just drawn to, like, the lights in the supermarket that was just open. It was more of a convenience store. And we'd just go in. And my friend, like, would sit, like, like started sitting on this floor on this convenience store, just, like, eye-gazing with what I think was a, um, 
a laundry detergent box that had a swirl or something. And I think it just got portaled in and it just started rolling over the floor laughing, like literally. And, and this la- lady comes by and says, is he okay? And we're like, oh, we just had some mushrooms. And she's like, oh, okay, okay, carry on. And like, there's no, like, there's no doubt in my mind that I was like, oh no, this is going to get us an issue or something, right? So if you would have been in the States, for example, first of all, I don't recommend anybody doing that period if it's legal not legal like that was just i didn't know better we didn't know better we luckily always had good experiences but like you know if that would have been in the states like somebody would have called the cops and then you're like have that issue like can you like i can't even imagine what that would be like so coming from the netherlands i i do think that there's a a, a light of hope of what it can be all over the world if our governments are finally getting their like act together and just realizing that this is the least harmful thing out there, which is even acknowledged by the World Health Organization. It's just like empirically, they have no foundation to say, like to keep this out of the hands of people in a legal manner. And somehow, I don't know. Well, it's America. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't America, have to, man. it has it's to all make, over the world. it's got to make dollars. And that's yeah. I, I, there's a bunch of confounding reasons why why it's going to take a while. I I am fundamentally convinced though that we're at the point of no return. We're we're slowly moving towards legalization, if not just handled by the states, are ultimately going to push the the federal government to to make that change. But it, it's not going to be fast. But hopefully we get there. And uh, yeah, so so we cannot um, have to worry about growing a couple mushrooms in our basement to augment and improve our life and, and deepen our spiritual experience with life and, and all that good stuff. Uh, can't, can't wait for that to happen. Um, yeah. So, so, okay. Talk to me because you, you said something interesting. You were like, well, of course we want to teach people how to grow, but of course we also don't just want to teach people how to grow. We want to do more. We want to talk about the integration. We want to talk about the preparation so talk me a little bit through, in your experience, the the important aspects to consider. So, Because I have a lot of people who watch my show who are over the age of 60. They are maybe retired. They're starting to face some really difficult things in life. So I got this demographic, right, of older folks who probably never in their life thought about using magic mushrooms that are now because of, you know, the Michael Pollan book or what something they saw on TV, or maybe their grandkids started talking to them about it, whatever. They are growing mushrooms. Some of my good friends in my discord are in their seventies and they are all about mushrooms. They love growing them. They love experiencing uh, the benefits of them. I would love to hear from your perspective. Because there's a lot of people that they start growing them and they haven't used them yet. They're afraid. They're worried that they need a trip sitter and they don't know who to get or whatever. Walk me through um, just some some tips and tricks or some uh, framework of thinking that somebody who's never had a trip experience before with mushrooms or anything necessarily. Just just the boot camp. What, what are things that you should be doing to prepare? What are things you should be doing to ensure that you have a safe experience? Just little tidbits of wisdom from, from your years of experience. I think actually some of the foundation that was laid in the 60s is pretty, pretty solid. And, and since then, we have um, built upon that, right? So you, you probably have heard of set and setting, meaning mindset and what is the setting like. Most people that have challenging experiences, when I talk to them, there's also, oh, yeah, I was at a party, right? That's already like a, that's an interesting setting, right? Although you might be feeling good. But then I also do want to add substance and, and dosage of the substance to an extent, right? So if you're, at a, if you're at a party and you take, for example, like, let's, let, let's take it the other way around because people, a lot of people are working with this as well and experimenting with this, ketamine right? Okay, you might have a little bit too much, and then you're out for 45 minutes to an hour, and then you can kind of come back back to normal again. Okay, so that's like understanding that aspect as well. But if you accidentally misjudge the, the dosage of your mushroom, you could just like be in a pretty intense like setting, 
with no ability to drive home <laughs> and like that might be too overwhelming for you right so like it's really wise to consider all of those things and i think also your mindsets but let's say you you're in your own space i think by creating your own space it's really important that you're just going to be comfortable that like uh you have everything prepared so not to have to deal with electronics because that's going to be hard let's say somebody is preparing to go on a deeper journey by themselves right um if you're afraid like it's always good to ask a friend to just like be around and this can be anywhere from being in the same space and helping you walk to the bathroom if that's too difficult or this can just be somebody that's in the same house right if you have a partner or uh, just a really good friend and you don't want them in the same space but you, you have a house that's big enough to have different rooms you can also just have a roommate uh, and just inform them that like you are about to go on this journey because that can be just really helpful just in the back of your mind oh if something goes wrong then i have my friend my partner the other person to uh, to help me out secondly like if you have all that set right like a good playlist uh enough enough water nearby making sure that you're all like prepared for for the journey uh i think a, a really good thing in preparation is also you know like what like thinking about like your intention and i think intention is really key right and sometimes can be having fun like there's nothing wrong with having a recreational experience like my mentor and friend julian vane really beautifully puts it like to recreate oneself right like there's power and beauty in recreation so that can be your intention but often like let's say we're talking to these uh people within your audience that are a little bit older maybe they want to um say a final goodbye to a loved one that has passed away or maybe they want to come into um acceptance of their own mortality that's a big one that's a, that's a really <laughs> hard one um but like having something like that to go into it and maybe journaling a little bit about that beforehand and then of course making sure that like you're as good in physical condition as can be like a like make sure you're feeling fresh maybe take a shower before eat healthy the days before and it can look differently for everybody like again like there's no f f set way right because i know people that like to mix mushrooms while they're having a beer and i know people that like feel like they have to be clear of any kind of substance including caffeine for a week before they can have a clear experience like it always depends but like find out what works for you you and by like there's only one way to find out and that's by experimenting and when you do experiment start low go slow that's really what i recommend like because you get more used to the space and more used to uh things that might come up that might be challenging right uh, and a big tool of that is the breath right it's, it's the breath because when you go back to the breath when you go back to breathing that's that's a pillar Make sure you're hydrated. That's another pillar. If something goes awry, not as you expected it to go, and like that, those two things fixes like 99% of it. With the added mindset bonus of accepting that that's got, like that this is what it is right now. Don't try to change it, but accepting what it is and knowing. And this is also a deep one for people that are more newer to working with these molecules, with these organisms, with these technologies. That it's gonna, it's not gonna last forever. And especially when people are working with LSD and you might have a challenging experience on a relatively high dose of LSD, it might feel like it's gonna last forever. In, in the literature, we don't know anybody that's been like hung up on this, that's gone too far on all of this. One last thing that I wanna say, although like a lot of these people often also experiment with cannabis, that's, uh, can for some people, they love it, right? For most people that I know, even cannabis enthusiasts like myself, combining tryptamine psychedelics with cannabis before kind of the last 25 percent of the journey is really a roll of the dice it can make it a lot better but i i recently had a a, a journey that i was like wow this is, we're kind of at the end and i smoked a little bit too much weed and then i got into kind of a negative mindset spiral that uh stopped me from going to sleep which was not pleasant I knew it was going to be over. I had a good night's sleep the next day. Maybe those are thoughts that needed to come up, but I had like an all rainbow sunshine experience. And then I smoked a little bit too much cannabis. And then it wasn't so, <laughs> then it wasn't so anymore. So I think those are the key tips of it, right? Like there's so much more info 
on this. Like this is this, this whole books written about this. We've made a whole course. We've do, we're doing a whole seven week cohort that's finishing this week. The people coming together for hours every week for seven weeks, and there's still endless amount of questions. Nobody knows all the answers, and anybody that claims to know all the answers, they're they're fake. Don't listen to them. Don't ever listen to anybody, mushroom cultivator, psychonaut that claims that they have the best answer and that they know everything because that's just not true. Yeah, I like what you said about, um, you know, you you can't control it while it is happening. Um, I always use the metaphor of the people that ride the roller coaster and they're holding on to the bar and they're afraid of every turn. And so you rode the roller coaster, but you didn't really ride the roller coaster until you put your hands up and you just kind of go with it and you don't die. Usually, I mean, 99.99% of the time you don't die. You, you, you just have a more complete experience. And I think that, um, that scares a lot of people though, especially if their first trip is going to be at the age of 70 or 74 or, you know, three months after they're diagnosed with a terminal illness, but, but they're so desperate, but, that is the important thing to keep in mind is that preparation, uh, like you said, to do some journaling, like get it out there. What are you nervous about? What are you afraid of? What's a, like pain out? What's the worst case scenario? Knowing the things you just reminded everybody of, which is it is temporary. It, you know, it, it's an afternoon and then it's done or whenever you do it. That and that you're not going to die, uh, assuming someone is keeping an eye on you, you, and you don't have any other, you know, health conditions that that could put you in a bad spot. Yeah, it's a very safe recreational, spiritual, medicinal process that that does so much for so many people. And uh, so, for everybody listening, if you haven't, if you just haven't been able to take that next step. Um, Jasper here and a lot of other people will, will tell you with just a little preparation um, and, and just, you know, a little bit of willingness to just put your hands up in the air and go for it. I like that metaphor. It, it's great. You got to ride the roller coaster. So, so you got people now, I think this is also really important because we're sort of in this era now of, you know, I watched a five minute YouTube video. I watched a 15 minute YouTube video and now I know everything about everything. And it kind of started with like Huffington Post articles, right? Where it was like, wow, the headline was so salacious that you didn't even have to read the article because kind of the 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 big hook was in the was in the title. And this has really changed how people work. But you actually you got full courses. You're 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 even longer format than a five hour podcast, right? This is tens of hundreds of hours. And then, like you're saying, you're meeting up with cohorts. And you're really exhaustively having these conversations and connections and building relationships with people. Talk to me about some of the changes you've seen in people who've been willing to sign up for some of these process, educational programs, the cohorts. Like, talk me through the value of that for somebody. That's a, that's a big one. Like, there's a. A lot of people that are micro curious and they 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 feel the call to come to our courses. Maybe they've seen some YouTube videos. They find that like not everybody is an online learner. Like it takes a very special kind of person to go on YouTube and go YouTube University and like try to figure out what this guy is saying and then that girl is saying and like piece it all together for yourself. That's like although a lot of people like to watch those things, I think actually the majority of people and not taking it specifically in the mushroom space because we are like we're doing it ourselves we like we like figure it out right i'm i'm like that myself as well but a lot of people that are curious and they just they just want to have that experience of like learning in person and seeing it and asking questions and some people like they take that up and they're like just hobby growers and that's great but we also get people that take it to a whole nother level man like a lot of my students are way better cultivators than i am right now uh, I, I know a lot of my students that have started mushroom cultivation companies, uh, m uh, like medicinal mushroom companies, psychedelic, like orientated companies, like uh, integration company, like uh, businesses, coaches, all of that stuff can come out of kind of a kickstart of that, that experience, right? Like if you kickstart yourself you and you go with that momentum, and this is what I tell everybody that comes to our cultivation course, the best place... To for, for, like the best thing to do for your success is to order all the stuff you need, but you're still here with us in Guatemala. So it's waiting for you. 
when you get home. Because otherwise, you're just going to be like, oh, I'm going to do it later. I'm going to remember all of it. And then slowly the experience fades. And then it, you don't have that drive because it's all fire, man. We need to like stoke our fire. And like, I think a course or is, you know, it's like, I'd say it's like 30% is actually the things that we teach. I think 30, let's say 33%. One third is what I teach. One third is just the container that we create because, because like, what it is, is that we are all like forming a really quick hyper community together. Like we eat together, like basically all the time, like minus you're sleeping, you're hanging out with mushroom people. And the conversation is going to be mushrooms and psychedelics. And this goes from experienced people to like complete newbies, but it's, it's really beautiful. So how it's fra uh, framed, we, we start the day with a mind body practice. This can be breath work or yoga or anything else. Then we have breakfast, then we do classes, then we have lunch, then we do classes or a field trip. We're going to go mushroom foraging with a Ma uh, Mayan mushroom guide who's like knows all the names in the local languages and all the ways that the uh, uh, local people are, are consuming these mushrooms. Uh, and then like we have more lectures, we have dinner, we have, we have a sauna here. So we sauna or we, we do a little like um, we like to call it variety show. So like more ways to get to know people, right? Because that's really the true core of that experience is getting to know the other people um, and building a connection. And you should see like our WhatsApp groups, our signal groups, all of the groups that we make for these cohorts and courses, people like year, five years later, they're still active in it. They're still sharing the mushrooms. They're growing. They're still meeting up. Like it is really like profound to see that amount of connection. And I normally don't really talk about this, but I since you have a pretty niche podcast and, and you've thrown yourself out there, we, we very tiny have it on the, the website that we also offer a, a group ceremony. So we're giving people like cubes, but within like a really small like literally small doses and we call it the celebration ceremony so we do tell people oh this is not about like dealing with all your traumas right now we're not here to do that we're just we the whole journey of the cultivation course is from spore to shroom and now you guys like we're building this big mushroom together and that's the journey and we all have one last bonding experience and then everybody's going to go away in like different corners of the world and like uh, still, we give people like a gram and a half, maybe two, and people have like ground shattering experiences of positivity because like all of the, the buildup that has happened. So for like, and that's just a side on for us, right? That's just something that we do out of passion and out of love. And luckily, like my business partner, Karina, is, she is a natural at that. I'm not, I'm not going to sit there in front and act like the guru. That's just not me. I, I don't understand that so many people want to do that because that's a lot of responsibility, man. So much responsibility. And like, like I can take on responsibility, but that kind of stuff, like I, I'm good one-on-one -on -one with friends. If a friend's like, Hey, I really want somebody to just watch over as I have a deep journey. Uh, like I can do that, but a group thing, like I can do that with knowledge and wisdom and making education fun. But on a spiritual level, that's something else. But to keep it light and all that stuff. But yeah, that's, man, people walk away with just a sense of belonging. And that's kind of, the, people come for the mushrooms. And the, the most impact it has is just the humans eventually, man. Yes, 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 yes. I, dude, one of my favorite overarching themes of what I'm doing here is myceliating. We are connecting people. We are, we are like, I like you use the term word nodes in, in the network. Yes. It's like, so this week, everybody gets to know Jasper. If, if you don't already know him, here's Jasper. And there are going to be some hyphal tips are going to get formed and they're going to go head towards fungi Academy and, and other people are going to go, yeah, he was cool. Okay, great. And then who's on next week. And maybe they, but the whole point is. The exposure that you get and the and you go down and have an experience. We just did this in Mexico with a bunch of people on our trip. And uh, like you just said, you you totally called it, man. My WhatsApp channel for that trip still blowing up all the time. You know, people still saying, hey, look at what I did or hey, you know, you sent me these spores. Check it out. Here's my first grow from the from the cubes we found in that pasture that day. And that's you are so right. That is a major component of the in-person learning they're just not going to get watching a, a youtube video by yourself 
you will absorb information, but that connection and like, why do we want this, right? Why do you want a spiritual experience? Do you want it to go hide in a hole for the rest of your life? Because nobody wants that. We want it because we, we want to feel connected. We want to feel loved. We want to feel like we can love other people and matter to people. And that shit happens in person, right? That the, the, the real juice is got to be face to face. Yeah, we can DM people and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and the online friends are cool. They're great. But every great online friend you have, you're just dying for the day you get to actually hang out with that person and meet that person and, and feel their, their, their energy and see who they really are vibing together. So, uh, dude, I, I love that. I think that's so great. Um, so now, so you said a third of it's what you're teaching. A third of it is, is that connection. What is that other piece? What, what, what are the other, like, I want to know all the good juicy details. Yeah, man. I think the the last like third is like the their their own love for the mushrooms, man. And it's just like we're we're just the substrate, basically, at Fungi Academy. We we're the substrate and like it's it's seeing that passion in people ignite and like pointing them in the right direction for them to grow more. That's 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 really beautiful, man. Like to see people fly. After not even knowing what like my like a high face, and then like people start teaching, man. Like I have students that are just full on mushroom cultivating teachers all over the world, and that's really what I like to see. And that's just straight from like Peter McCoy's book, like Radical Mycology. When I read that, it's like, well, what if ten teachers teach ten teachers, and then teach ten teachers, and it's just like this this thing, and that really left a a lasting impact on me, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm seeing. I, so I just had him on not too long. Uh, we're we're trying to you know get the word out about about this year's radical mycology convention convergence. I think he calls it. And uh, there's a lot of echoes between the his philosophy and what I see you do. Um, the the experience, right? That it's not just about learning every little academic bit of information, not knowing exactly when you know, uh, mitosis happens versus meiosis versus karyogamy versus plasmogamy versus all the agamies. It's that's, that's fine. But, but way more important is who are you teaching to? Who are you learning from? And so I, I see a lot of similarities there and that's really compelling. That's why are we doing this? We're not just doing this because we're like super nerdy and we love mushrooms. And so we're like a physicist only for mushrooms. There is another component to the mushrooms. There is a reason there is a, a blue rush. There is a reason there is a psychedelic renaissance. There is something spiritual, metaphysical, important. I love Darren always uses the word technology. You use the word technology as well. In the end, Darren is right, right? Because he's always saying, like, we're just mushrooms having a human experience. And I do think that, like, you know, we are all inspired by one another. But, like, the biggest inspiration for all of this stuff, what Peter wrote, what Paul was written in the 70s and the 80s, like, what McKenna wrote, like, it's all deep down inspired by the mushrooms. So, like, it doesn't surprise me that people come to similar conclusions, right? Like... That's the thing. Like you, you call like it myceliating, and this is the first time we're talking about it today. And like we, we've we've used that term also. And like, but also the human mycelium is a term that we like have been working with. And this is also the thing. What it what come up, comes up when people get defensive? It just doesn't. It feels so antifungal. <laughs> if like somebody like I, I've encountered that people are using words, and it's like, oh, but that's my word. I came up with that. But anything mushroom related, be it like to myceliate human mycelium using the word technology for these things all of that like somebody else has done that so like none of like understanding that none of your ideas are yours and just not being protective of it doesn't matter like if you're successful in this podcast everybody in the mushroom scene is going to be more successful and that's that's the fungal mindset man like if there everybody is abundant we are all like abundant right that's a fungal mentality and like that was really well fortified in Charles Eisenstein's book. It's we wrote a couple of years ago, but like he wrote the more beautiful world our hearts knows is possible. And like he phrases all of these things beautifully 
And then like I found the, 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 the myceliate and the fungal connections to what he was writing because again, we don't have original ideas because we're all influenced. We're all influenced by what we've read, what we've heard from other people. Like unless you made up a new word, which is very rare, you're just copying what other people are saying. That's how we learn that like you have kids. I'm seeing my friend's kids and my business partner kids like grow up and like start using words. They're just repeating. Like my, my friend's kid, like I was saying bro to him because he's like six and I just think it's funny to call him little bro. And then like my friend, his dad was like, he's been hanging out with too much of my son. He just kept saying bro the, the whole time. It was like, that's how we learn. That's how we learn language. Yeah. Well, I, so I'm not bilingual, but so you can speak to this, but some languages, there are phrases that are very difficult to translate because they're couched in a cultural experience that isn't mirrored necessarily in another culture or like all the idiomatic expressions. I love hearing every, all other cultures, idiomatic expressions, because they always inform you about what the culture is like in, in that community. How can you ever say you had an original thought? I don't know how you can't. It's like, uh, you know, comedians, sometimes they argue about a joke because a lot of jokes are very timely, right? Something's going on in the world and they start writing jokes about it. And then they're, uh, and I, I say this cause I used to live with a comedian and I heard all about this crap. One famous comedian would have a bit and then on the West coast and another guy in New York would have the same bit or roughly the same bit. And then they'd get into a feud about it. And it was like, you guys are funny and you live in the same country and you were you were reacting to the same experience and your brain we have essentially the same brains the the same mechanics in our brains so it just so happened that you two came up with basically the same bit so yeah man instead of the ego reacting to that and being like oh fuck that guy why you know he stole that from me instead the mushrooms tell me to go yeah we, that's a point of connection. We saw it the same way. We, we drew from the same re linguistic resources and experiential resources to say the same thing. That's a cool moment. That's not a defensive moment. Why do people, man? Yeah, that's, that's uh, truly, I believe that's why the, the fungus is the greatest metaphor for our time right now because this is what we are lacking, what we are missing. We need to myceliate. We need to be, as you say, human mycelium. We need to be working on those connections. We need to compost the old to fruit the new, man. And like regarding this new, like these ideas, like somebody thought of this, man, like Rupert Sheldrake, Merlin Sheldrake's dad, he came up with this whole morphogenic field theory, like crucial way to look at the world and like how ideas are not ours but like our consciousness is not even ours we're just our brains are antennas tapping into that stuff and that's also why we consume tryptamines that we tap into that field and can communicate what a lot of people perceive to be directly with the mycelium the mushrooms right like a great idea like a example of this i made this video with after schools a relatively big youtube channel uh, about panspermia and i came up with this idea that like oh maybe like it was aliens making the microorganisms like bacteria and fungal spores and just shooting it all over the universe. And then just now, two months ago, I learned that Francis Crick, like the guy that like thought of the double helix, wrote a whole book on this. I know like in the 80s that I'd never read, that never came across my thing. I'm like, whoa, I thought I had an original idea, but no, 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 no. Somebody was like, was me before, before I was even born. So that was, that was just hilarious to me. I always in my head start to wonder, how different were we a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago to now? I don't think we were any different. I don't think our DNA has had enough time to like radically evolve. So maybe we're smarter, but we're the, the capacity for the intelligence we currently have was present theoretically as soon as we officially became homo sapiens. And so that means all the epiphanies we think we're having right now, particularly in the interpersonal, spiritual realm, religious realms, a million people probably already had those ideas. Like the best-selling book right now in self-help is probably an idea that's 4,000 years old. You just, we don't know. We'll never know that. But yeah, man, there's, 
how many billions of people on this planet and they're all complex and infinite universes of thought like you and like me and like everybody watching the show. That's that's why the best thing we can do is get together. We go to Fungi Academy in person, meet other people that are vibing the way we're vibing. And uh, it's really exciting. I, I can only imagine how, I mean, some of these people's minds must just get utterly blown when they go down and, and get to hang out with people that are as excited about mushrooms as they are and learn more and just get empowered and, and excited. I, I, I bet you get to see a lot of really cool, cool people going through some cool experiences. So many cool people, man. Like everybody that like just has the, the balls basically in a metaphorical sense, even if whatever gender sex you have to just step, say yes most people come alone, go to Guatemala in a rural place. And if like most people that do this, that like have had like a relatively quote unquote normal life, they're all their families is like, oh, that's dangerous. You shouldn't do that. Like think about that. And they go against what their peers, the people around them are saying to just follow this. Yes. Yes. To the mushroom. That's so brave. That's so brave. And like when people don't actually come here, and it doesn't matter their backgrounds and they're open. That's the key thing, man. Like we do, you know, some ice breaking stuff to make people realize we're all humans. And then people the, every day, they just come into it with an open heart, open mind. And that's the magic. Like, like people from ba different backgrounds, man, people from born in different countries that hardly speak the same language. Like they're, they're connecting. And there's only, that's not much more, more beautiful in life i think what what was the most funny is that just like the people that are like you said we also have a bunch of people that are a, a little bit have have more life experience and then like it's, it's seeing them act as kids like this whole world goes open to them of like not only mushrooms but communal living and kind of a more bohemian lifestyle which i've like lived since since my my 18th and 19th and stuff like that like it's just really beautiful to see people's like thing like attitude change like a lot of people are brought up against their will within uh, like a christian religious uh background uh, and we do some form of well it's not really a prayer it's a gratitude circle before dinner and people's whole thing is like oh like they're so resistant the first day and then people are sprinting to to be there because it's a nice moment to share gratitude with everybody in one space and yeah transformation happens and that's 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 just like saying stuff that you're grateful for. Like, oh, I was grateful to, to have a good laugh today and a, like a, a warm meal and some like so cold water over my face. And that's just the most profound thing for people. And I do think that that's enabled by the experience of working with the sacred mushroom. Because the sacred mushrooms, they, I, I'm a little bit against this whole ordeal of that they're just going to make better people. First of all, it's insinuating that people that never had those mushrooms are not like are worse that fucking sucks that's a gnarly thing to say about people and then the second thing is that i know like you've been in the space for a long time i've been in the space for almost 14 15 years i know plenty of dickheads that like consumed a lot of psychedelics that are still not nice people and and that's just you see that everywhere you just like so it is not about that but like i do think they can be an incredible tool for us to become more humble and just open to these experiences and open hearted, open minded, because that's what all the religious, philosophical teachings are actually teaching is just go into places with an open mind, open heart, be curious. Yeah, I mean, right? There's nothing wrong with anything Jesus said. I mean, what'd the guy say? He, he said, hey guys, don't worry about the Old Testament. How about this? Just get along, love each other, treat each other right. That's all he wanted. Well, what about Buddha? He just roamed around laughing because he saw how absurd most of all the stuff we do is, right? Yeah, all, all these all these religious figures that now have tens, if not hundreds of millions of people following them, they all figured something out. It just doesn't necessarily mean that some of their follows, you know, have, have figured that out yet. But I do truly agree with you. The mushrooms can frequently put you in in a zone to have a lot of these epiphanies, a lot of these realizations. 
But unfortunately, the reality is there are some people, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's experiences, whether it's personality, um, I don't know. They they are nasty, and I don't think I don't think the mushrooms can change that. It just kind of works for some people, not for everybody. But I don't know about you. If you have not tried them, I, I, I don't know if I can think of a single person I know who has not tried them that I wouldn't go, oh, you you're interested? Yeah, go for it. Give it a try. Let's see what it. Let's see how you feel about it. McKenna said it the best. Terrence McKenna. Uh, having gone through life without taking psychedelics is like having gone through life without having had sex. <laughs> it's like it's not for everybody. You sure about that? But sex is also not for everybody. There's definitely people that are completely asexual, hundred percent. But like. You know, it's it's a human experience. It is a fundamental human experience, and it's it's worth having that experience. And like we mentioned before, it's safe. It's incredibly insightful. It can be incredibly powerful. You're gonna feel feels that you never felt before. You're gonna see things you've never seen before. That's all purely like uh, neurochemically, like foundationally understood within science right now, because we're changing our neurochemistry and therefore our consciousness for a limited amount of time and therefore we experience things in a different way and we can look at things that we've looked at to say for a very long time in a new light and that's just incredible yeah i had i had a an ex neurosurgeon on the show um sky dr rick and he he was talking about default mode network and and for me the the metaphor that clicks for me is just the the same way that what is the first thing you do when your computer is acting goofy you just reboot it, just reboot it. And, and I, I, I mean, the more and more I'm studying up and reading about some of the current research on traumatic brain injuries and neuroplasticity and all this kind of stuff, I'm sitting back going, yeah, dude, if nothing else, this is just temporarily completely reframing the way your consciousness works so that when you come back and write like the day after a trip, it's like the best day of your freaking life. I mean, everything looks better. You feel good. It's just because you got rebooted a little bit, right? I mean, if if it does nothing else, it just gives you a, a, a reset, a reframe, a, just just an opportunity to see your life in the exact spot you're in, but from somehow from another another spot. Which is for me, it's it's very spiritual. It's very special. Uh, and dude, I can never get sick of calling it technology it's a cool tech right it's a good term to use these days technology is a tool and like it's not technology invented by us it's technology invented by like this alien fungal organism that's really hard for us to understand as a chemical mainframe to communicate with our consciousness that's how i personally see it but it's a technology and like any technology like our phone like the knife in my kitchen they can get they're a great tool but it can also hurt us real bad you know and and that's the thing that we look out for because I think people forget the severity, especially when people are working with uh, PTSD and other really like heavy pasts. That this can be like a challenging thing, and this is not shits and giggles and rainbows and sunshine. This has to. We shouldn't fear it. I don't think you should fear anything, but fear itself. But like we should only have reverence and. M- yeah, reverence for these these organisms and these tools. And sometimes I, I forget that, especially now we're in this middle stage psychedelic renaissance and people are commercializing this sacrament and ex, like selling it like as like for ACO DMT under its name. And like this is this is not, I think, the good way to go about it to make more flashy uh bar chocolate bars that have skulls skulls can be good of course because it's referring to that but like i just see such a commercialized drive from the cannabis industry mainly into this and i think that's forgetting kind of what the yeah what the the power of these organisms this technology can be like we have forgotten with cannabis man cannabis can be an incredibly powerful psychoactive it can be a spirit ally a plant ally like people from all over the world have used it for millennia and now it's a sort of like numbing commodity that most people smoke to forget i i'm not i'm not i'm I'm not chiefing every day but but i'll tell you what i do like 
there is a different energy that if if you're just if you get some good herb I, I don't dab i don't do any of that other stuff but there is just a good zone it puts you in it's a different zone and it opens you up to i mean i i actually don't like using this whole frequency thing but it really kind of is right it puts you in another vibe and so you you can process different things in that vibe than than you would on a trip and even like you're saying i like lsd it's a different it's another technology it's a different tool it's doing different things and uh i really hope that because of people like you and all the pioneers before you and before me and before the th tens of thousands of people who are now more openly discussing this and saying yeah you know this got stigmatized it's not true this is this is something sacred and special that our human ancestors have probably been using for an insane amount of time we got to just we got we got to make it legal again it, it cannot be it cannot just be globally something that in almost all countries is illegal it's like it's like making a butterfly illegal excuse me sir i saw a butterfly flying around your yard uh you know we we made that monarch butterfly illegal last year why oh well one guy poked his eye out with a butter with a butterfly so now we i mean what but it, it does if you learn the history right because like not to go into the weeds but like i think it's a very open book in all the documented files that the nixon administration was very clear on why they did it very clear it, it's just to like hold out like it was uh suppression of ethnic minorities within the U.S. at the time, and of suppression of anti-Vietnam War protesters, students, and therefore hippies. That's they're, they're very clear about that. If if you are a pharmacologist or or a medical professional, and you look you look at the schedule of drugs, and you don't go, how the hell did marijuana and mushrooms get in the first schedule? Bro, fentanyl is legal. Fentanyl is scheduled, whatever. It's, you could just, like, doctors prescribe it in certain cases. It's insane. Well, now, when, so I use it in the ER all the time, but it's like 50 mics. It's like 50, sometimes 100 mics. It's very, very crazy small doses. But yeah, and in those applications, it's fine. Actually, fentanyl, usually I hate administering it because it's usually not enough pain resolution for, for people. It's not, uh, you know, it's all this stuff. It's a tool too. We use ketamine. It's a disassociative. When, when we got kids that we need to like set a shoulder or something like that, it, it works great for that. Um, but all these things, the minute you, this is why I love t saying technology or tool because it, it puts it in the proper perspective, right? It, you're, you're going, this, this thing, it has a function. If dosed right and, and used properly, there, there's a huge benefit to it. Even if recreation can can be a function, that, that can be a huge benefit. Some people need some recreation in their troubled lives. Everybody needs recreation. Not everybody, not some people, everybody needs to have fun. It's a human right to, to like to be able to kick back and like just lay in the sun, not having to do anything. It's, it's more like even more of a crime what the current capitalism has done to the free time of people, especially even in the U.S., which doesn't make sense. It's like the richest country in the world, and like people work more than ever, and like it's always about money. Yes. <laughs> so dumb. Man, we, we went to Italy a few years ago, and uh, I'm just like, wow, I don't want to go home now. It's just more chill. And I, I went to Europe when I was a kid and toured with a band and um, every single country. I was like, I love this country. Go to Netherlands. Love Netherlands. Go to Denmark. Love Denmark. Go to Germany. Wow, these German people are amazing. In my history book, I, I thought they were all going to be Nazi assholes. Like, come on. Yeah. Anyway, what? Did we just lose him? Your camera is gone. Yeah, I just got a notice. I'm um, here. I'm gonna make a mark of where that it was right about one hour.
I can hear you. Hopefully I'll see you soon. I keep say I keep getting a notice saying Jasper's changed their device. Okay, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Cool. All right, more 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 technical difficulties, but it's okay. All of it, you know, the further you back, you can like go all the way back and you can argue that all of these qualms that are happening with our society start have their roots in the industrial revolution, you know. Um perhaps even, you know, like where I'm from, like we are like mm, culture is more connected to land spirits has been was wiped away by Julius Caesar, right? Like more over two thousand years ago. Like we have forgotten, and I think a big part of what we have forgotten is um, how to grow up, which is really like it's a weird thing to say. Like, as like hard things make us grow up, like a rite of passage, man. Like for me, it was travel. It was Oliver's death, but also my work with with psychedelics, man. And if you look at like uh, First Nations and other ind indigenous cultures all over the world, they they have one thing in common is they have rites of passages and especially as as male bodied individuals really like good have more support with that because like women generally not this doesn't go right especially in the uh, in the global north at all but like uh they have this physical rite of passage when they're a lot younger and you can argue that you know people from jewish heritage have the bar mitzvah but who really is a man after their bar mitzvah and i think well curated psychedelic journeys for young adults and forcing them or like not forcing them um encouraging them to do something difficult like a vision quest or a one way trip to a place you've never been before or what anything that just gets you out of that place what is normal where you're safe where you can in a still safe manner fully grow into who you have the potential of becoming and then being recognized by the rest of your community as, oh, you have gone through that ordeal. Because that's also a big one. Because for me, in my young adult life, most of it was proving myself to others. I felt like I, I could use my intellect to prove myself to others. But like the mushrooms told me that like I didn't eventually, after a lot of work, it was not one, one time or 10 times or 50 times, that I, I'm good as is. I don't need to prove myself to anybody. And, you know, there's... There's a lot of work that uh, needs to be done. Yeah, all we got to do is just completely change how our society set up. That's it. Super easy. I, I sort of feel like we're going through another, you know, Garden of Eden story, right? Like we were innocent and everything was great. And then, then we ate from the tree of knowledge again. You know, the Industrial Revolution, which everybody talks about worrying about the robots, right? Ford turned us into robots the minute they invented the assembly line. We, we, we've been robots for a while now. Um, that I, li I live in America. Trust me. It's a, it's a country full of robots. I've been there, man. <laughs> and yeah, they, they got us working ourselves to death. Why? To buy stuff that we're never around to enjoy in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's really sad. But this, this medicine, this technology, these tools, these things that have been around forever that, that very likely our ancestors used to help evolve our frontal lobes and, and make us so intelligent. Um, hopefully we, we can find them again and get some of this stuff uh, reconnected to where, you know, vibing the way it's supposed to and people seeing what it's all about, which I, I'm going to tell you from everything you've talked about tonight. I think the one that's speaking to me the most, most powerfully is the idea that you know, when you bring everybody down to Guatemala and they get together, you said you did some icebreakers, but you said to remind everybody that we're all human. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many mushrooms I do, I'm going to still be a human being. And you're still a human being. And, and if we're lucky, we're enlightened. But what does it change? At best, it just changed how we react to, to, you know, what happens in life and how people treat us and all that kind of stuff but that's really where it's at is, is the connecting with people um appreciating one another honoring uh you know like the really what namaste really means which is I fucking see you i see who you are yes i see you dude in your perfection 
in your imperfection, in, in your impulsivity, in, in your calm, you know, uh, peaceful moments, all that stuff. But man, we don't live in, in America. We do not live in a culture that, that encourages any of that. It is very challenging. I do think you can make it everywhere. I've been in places where the US, in the U.S. where people are living like that, you know? It's harder. And like, like here, it's just like a different pace of life. But like, we can create that world, right? And it starts with the self. And it starts with like being vulnerable because that's the most courageous thing you can do. And then just like seeing other people. And if like they feel seen, they can see you. And that spreads, man. Like I, I'm seeing it happen. I'm an optimist at heart, man. Like I see the, the change happen. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's going to be like, oh, the next 20 years, 50 years. No, but I, I see the, the desire for a different life for in so many people. And yes, of course, also not so many people, man, but like also so many people. And that wave is, is, is rippling. Because when, you know it, you know, it's like when people meet you and you have that calm presence and you deeply listen to what they have to say, they're touched. And like what happens when we feel touched by people that we are hanging out with, then like, again, with the same thing with language, we want to become more like that. Damn, what's making Michael Geeky such a cool dude? How can I be more like him? That's the reality. You can be the example within your ecosystem. Yeah, man. Well, okay, fine. We can do it in America here too. I don't know. I think I'm a little bit more of a, not a pessimist, but a realist. It's, it's a big, it's a big wall we got up here. It's, it, it, it definitely takes some super courageous, heroic moves to, to do the, the things that should be done like vulner male vulnerability in, in the United States. Do you know how many guys I know who are just, I mean, I work in the ER, so I see what meds you take. Do you know how many 40 to 60 year old men are just, they're taking their, they're chewing their Viagra every day. They're, they're, they're taking their testosterone pills. They're, they, they can't be man enough. They can't bench enough in their sixties. Look how much I can bench. It's like, bro, relax. I think you can be an optimist and a realist because I'm both. And I know that's hard. That's hard fucking work <laughs> because I see all the shit that's going on in the world. But then also I see all the light that's going on and like, I, I, I do a lot of men's work. We have a circle here every week. I try to find circles wherever I go. And that's like 90% of the work is not like, oh, me dealing with my shit, but just seeing that somebody else is dealing with their own stuff. And again, with this understanding, it's like, oh man, I see you. Namaste. And that's such a loaded turn, right? But like, it, there's so much that we can learn from just listening to what other people are dealing with in their life. You think you're the only one? You think you're the only one that like, is addicted to pornography. You think you're the only one that's addicted to alcohol or cannabis. And you see all these people that like, you see this ripped guy, like cry about how insecure he is about his, like this one weird, like how his like six pack is not perfectly shaped. It's fucking weird, man. But we all have that shit. We all have it. And anybody that lies about that is just silly. That's kind of with this fake matricism. You don't only see this in the U S you see this all over the world, but like, that is, honestly, it's not, it's not sustainable, right? That's, that's the thing. It's just not sustainable for them. And I hope that they figure it out in their lifetimes. But it's not sustain, sustainable for us as a culture and, and as a society. And we'll, we'll, we'll grow back to it. I think the natural order will always go back to that because that's what fungi do as well, right? They compost all the things that are not working. And then it goes back to a thing that's working. Right. And we were just in a phase right now where it's not working. And, you know, we're, who knows where it's going to be in 100 years, 500 years. I'm pretty confident the mushrooms are going to be doing their thing. And I'm pretty confident that maybe less humans, but some humans somewhere are going to be doing their thing just as much. You really got to decide what to put your energy into. And I like the idea of putting your energy into how you want life to be, how you want your society to be. And be those people that are acting those ways, even though nobody else around you is doing it. Yeah. So I, and, and you're a great example of that, dude. You're just, you, you, you went against the grain in a lot of ways. You kept following those things. I mean, you didn't go home during COVID Jasper. Come on. How dare you not go home and see your mom come, but that's okay. It is okay to do those things. 
Plus, all you would have done is gotten a bunch of COVID if you went back home anyway. I mean, Europe was a hot mess. America was a hot mess. You you probably had, you probably made the smartest possible move you could have made. But society tells you, society loves to tell you a little story every once in a while about what you should be doing. That's a lot of disconnect, man. Like our guts. Like what's the what's the here? Like a lot of like I think the First Nations indigenous cultures they said that this is where the, this is where the brain this is where our brain is at. Like the Egyptians thought nothing of the brain. They're like, oh, this is just some extra stuff we have to deal with with mummification. But they thought you thought from your heart. That's where they, they thought, thought like thoughts were coming from. And like, yeah, man, I think, I think it takes brave people to change the world. And it has always taken brave people to change the world. And, and like just getting your face out there and talking about these things that's, that work for you. And, and it just takes one person, man. You just need to change, like you, like one person that's influenced, and that's like a ripple fire, like that's that's all it. And nobody's perfect. I think that's another thing that like too many people are too afraid to be perfect. I'm not perfect. I, I'm like the last person to acknowledge that I'm perfect. I still get angry about stupid stuff. It's not like I'm here sitting high and mighty on a cushion, like meditating for like two hours a day here in Guatemala. Like, hey, I catch myself doom scrolling from time to time. We're all attached to these these things and anybody that would tell you that they're higher and mightier than that that's just bullshit so and i think that's like also what mushrooms can teach man compassion compassion for yourself for others they're just easy like again we come back to what jesus was saying man very simple stuff be nice to each other love your neighbor be nice to yourself take the day off on sunday <laughs> oh man god jesus figured some shit out back then how about that yeah I love it. Well, man, uh, this was a lot of fun. We definitely got to do this again. Um, well, like, like I'm, uh, I'm definitely getting to the point where, uh, uh, I got some guests I want to start bringing back and, and have some more focused discussions on things. And, and you're definitely in that camp. Um, I, I loved, uh, man, when you brought up Rupert Sheldrick, I was like, of course this guy knows about that guy. Of course, man. Of course. Yeah, they're just some that man. When I read that book, I said, you know what? There are books you read. It doesn't matter if they're right. It matters that it it gave you such a paradigm shift in your thinking that it allowed you to see everything completely differently. And you start observing and you just your eyes just open up a little bit more. And that was that guy wrote a bunch of books that made me feel that way for sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, well, we're going to link those books and, uh, so you guys can check all those out. We're going to have all the links for, for fungi Academy. We'll set you up as well. Use code Michael geeky. You get 25% off our online courses. Help out the Michael geeky podcast. Check out what, what fungi Academy is doing. Anyway, I'm going to let you get back to Guatemala and your gigantic, um, like official not yurt but kind of like a huge giant circular building with an amazing ceiling and and an amazing view and and all that good stuff um enjoy your cloud forests and, and your mayan expeditions and all the cool people that come down that that you get to impact and 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 expose to this amazing technology man it's 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 really commendable thanks man and thanks for like all you do and like inviting a like wide range of different speakers and yeah man like i hope we get to go in the forest one day and like maybe consume some active just like hang out let me know when you go to mexico mexico is close cool man all right well this was great i hope everybody uh enjoyed getting a chance to get to know jasper uh and and if fungi academy wasn't on your radar go check them out they have really quality content they know what they're doing they know what they're talking about they make it fun um check them out all right dude since, since we talked about it all right for real namaste go do you i'm a do me and until next time just keep doing what you're doing because it's working likewise brother all right, guys that was jasper d of the fungi academy i had a blast sitting down and talking with that guy and uh, every painstaking hour of editing that video together was well worth it. Um, I really, really was excited to share uh, our talk uh, with you guys. I'm, uh, <clears throat> he, he's, he's what I'm all about. He's all in. He's trying to contribute. He's trying to do more for the community. He's trying to uh, improve our myceliating 
as he says, human mycelium. Uh, yeah, we got to be human mycelium, guys. We, you know, we, all, all these people I'm having on, they got these catchphrases. They're important, right? We're, we're, we're mushrooms having a human experience. Um, we're human mycelium. We are. We are. We are creating our cakes every day. What's your cake look like? Are, are you forming connections with people? Are, are you being a positive person? Are you behaving ethically, morally, uh, justly? Are you following the golden rule with people? I know right now this community is going through some shifts, some changes, a lot of uh, insecurity, a lot of fear, uh, a lot of financial insecurity right now for a lot of people. And uh, I, I just hope everybody takes a minute and finds a center and says, but who the fuck am I? Who am I? Who am I going to be on my worst day? Am I going to be a piece of shit on my worst day? Or am, am I going to be the guy I am deep down? No, maybe for some of you, that is a piece of shit. I'm, and if that's you, I'm sorry. But I think a lot of people watching this show, that's not you. And I think none of us were born that way. And I think all of us can reconnect and find that uh, that good, pure, light of life that we had when we were young so i th that's kind of what i'm getting at here guys uh right now during these dark times during these big shifts online you know people where'd my facebook friend go oh he's on discord i don't like discord right life is change we're, we're changing all the time i mean how many freaking world religions focus on this concept they all do so what we got to do is just stay centered be good, treat each other well, form those connections. And I think this, this period of time, this is an opportunity to do that even more. So anyway, I'm looking forward to doing that at NAMA this week. Just a couple of days, we'll be hopping on a plane with Happy. We're going to go to uh, Washington State. His first time at the Pacific Northwest. Uh, not my first time, but I have never been to this part of Washington. I am very excited. And word on the street is it is going to be an absolutely epic weekend for mushroom hunting. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to share with you guys uh, everything I learned, uh, all the people I met. I'm sure uh, as a result, I'll have a bunch of people have on the show and uh, should be a good time. Uh, I'm getting pretty excited. Anyway, um, this week, think about, uh, you know, being that human mycelium. Think about your cake. What's your cake look like? Let's let's get that cake in order. You know, surface conditions, guys. Let, let's knock out our surface conditions. Let's make sure um, we're, we're taking care of ourselves in a way so that we can myceliate properly. And uh, a big part of that is to just go grow some mushrooms. Mushrooms. <laughs>